so I told you last week we were going to kind of change the order of things. I know we started talking about uh, the halakha not working on Shabbat, and um, I want to switch things up a little bit because uh, I'm trying to, uh, when I teach a series like this, I try to put it in the most logical order possible so that each teaching builds on the last one, and sometimes I get ahead of myself, sometimes I get things messed up, and um, you guys may not notice, and it might not matter to you, but it matters to me and my how I think about it, the mechanics of, of the, the flow of thought and all that kind of stuff. So um, I want to take this week and next week and talk about um, one of the commandments around Shabbat being uh, to sanctify or remember or observe. There are several ways that the Torah talks about this. Um, and just as a quick, you know, kind of quick overview um, I want you. I, I want to try to explain how I view what we talk about as far as uh, not only just keeping the commandments, following the Torah, being Torah pursuer, or whatever word we want to use to classify whatever it is that we're doing here. Uh, we, in my mind. The end goal of us, of our pursuit of the commandments, is to grow into the stature of Messiah. That should be the end goal. That should be the output. There should be the result. It should be the effect. Um, that we are, are uh, there's several stages of Torah observance or Torah obedience. If you, if you want to put it that way, there's this, this idea that, well, God said it, so we have to obey it. That's one level. And I would, I would think of that as kind of surface. Well, God said it, so I have to do it. Well, what is the motivation? What's the kavanah, the intention behind that type of attitude? I respect it. Go ahead and do it. But there's more there than that. There's also an idea of, well, I've tried everything else to be blessed or to be healed or to be led or to be connected or whatever whatever you know we we're looking for i've stood in every prayer line i've gotten hands laid i've got i've done all the things i've given money i've said you know the prayers i've done all and nothing has worked so now i'm going to try this commandment thing because it says in deuteronomy 28 if you do these things then god will bless you so maybe this is the way to get whatever blessing that i'm after and in that way, you may have more of a sense of following the commandments for a different intention, and the, the intention may not be always the most, the most right. And what I want us to keep in mind is that I, I really believe what I, I said in worship, that I believe what most of us need more than anything right now, I, just as a, as a quick you know, thing, I know that, so I talk about all the time my Baptist upbringing. I didn't really experience much uh, I don't have much spiritual baggage from my Baptist upbringing um, maybe a little guilt you know because the Baptists are pretty good at that um, you know but most of my baggage comes from the spirit filled circles that I was in after that I'm sure that some people out there grew up Baptist and you have baggage from that and your baggage looks different than mine but that's okay but so many of these things that we're working through, I believe God led us to this place, to this season, to this family in order to work through those things, those issues. I think that's what this is for. The problem is that you can't work through hurts and, and traumas and pain. And you can't heal from those things just from a, a mental standpoint. You have to actually put action to your healing. And in, in, in so many ways, my baggage comes from being promised a certain thing. So for me, my weak spot, I guess, was always that I just want to be right with God. That's always been my heart since I was a kid. I never knew what that meant. I, sometimes I still don't know what that means. I just want, at the end of it all, I want God to say, you did good, I'm proud of you. 
That's all I want. Out of, I'm not talking about out of my relationship with God. I'm talking about out of life, period. That's all I've ever wanted. Forget jobs and homes and cars and relationships and all of that. My base instinct, my base need in the bottom, the tips of my toes from the time I can remember was I just want to be, I just want to be right with God. And so I never really cared about physical blessing. Like that's why like the Kenneth Copelands and those never really uh, appealed to me because I didn't care about some of that stuff. But what I did want was I did want to be able to hear the voice of God and know that I was in God's perfect will in a perfect time, in a perfect place. And so I have issues that look like that. I have issues from some of those types of things. Yours may be a lot different depending on what you want from God or what you're expecting your relationship with God to be and how the, the churches, ministries, pastors that you were a part, you were, were in your life, how they have you know, helped to shape that or distort that, whichever it may, it may be. But I really feel like our main hurdle from getting to where we are to where we want to be is healing from some of that stuff and moving on. And sometimes moving on is hard because our pain becomes our security. Our, our damage becomes our identity. And we get so comfortable operating in a, in a damaged sense of who we are. We get so, trouble, so, so used to and comfortable in operating in an insecurity or a liability that we have that it becomes comfortable. And the truth is that we, would, we don't know how to act if we're not living in that trauma we don't know what a life without that damage looks like we don't know what a life without that inconsistent or that insecurity excuse me we don't know what that seems like because we're so comfortable with it we're so close to it it's be, it's our identity it's who we are and if anyone sits here or listens online and thinks that you don't have any of those you are incredibly mistaken because we all have them and I guarantee you this somebody else can tell you what yours is if you don't know somebody else will be more than happy to share it with you which brings me back to what we talked about several months ago do your own inventory of yourself but also get somebody who loves you and supports you to tell you things about yourself that you don't recognize good bad and ugly In all of this healing, what does this have to do with remembering the Sabbath? How many of us believe that Yeshua was insecure? If he's our goal, if he's our model, if he's the, 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 the goal, the telos, as it says in the New Testament, the one we should be modeling ourselves after, let's ask some questions about him. Do we believe that he was a man of insecurity? We believe he had insecurities. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. What's that? If he if he's, has a human nature, shouldn't he? I don't, I'm, again, I don't have these answers. I'm just throwing this out for some things that we've never, maybe, maybe you've never considered. What are some of the other challenges that we have, you know, that, that have been created by humans or, or others besides insecurities you know we have bitternesses we have jealousies we have uh you know angers we have uh you know short tempers we're reactionary we have all these things now i'm not saying these things are sins they're not sins they can become if we don't if, if we let them get out of hand but 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 pain and reactions to trauma and, and, and wounds that we have are not sin. So if you think, well, no, Yeshua was sinless, that we, he wouldn't have any of these things. That's not what I'm saying. You can have flaws, you can have pain, you can have wounds that are not sin. Not everything is about sin. The way that the Sabbath in my mind and, and what has, wor has happened in my life is that I tried so long to heal mentally and emotionally. And yet when the Torah became a part of my life and I started actually doing physical things and, and, and centering my life around actions, things began, the dust began to settle a little bit. Things began to come 
together in ways that never have before. And this is not like a 12-step program or like a self-help program. This is the creator's way of giving us a new identity. See, the identity that you have, broke, busted, and disgusted, or, you know, insecure and, and bitter and angry and whatever, that is not the identity of Messiah. Now, again, did Messiah have some insecurities? Maybe so. You know, and did he have some some other type of things maybe so i'm not and i don't think that i don't think that uh that decreases his you know his stature at all because as chris said if if there was some humanity in there then there very well could have been some some of those other things remember yeshua inter interacted with people just like we do and most of our issues don't come because you were born that way most of them come because somebody hurt you again some of the major uh, throughout the, the scriptures I think if you if you take a comprehensive look you bear this will bear out that our sin against God is one thing but God is big enough to handle that we repent he goes we're good let's move on what God is concerned about is how we sin against each other how we sin against each other is the thing that God is it's the thing that destroys the world the thing that destroys creation is not how we shake our fist at God. The thing that destroys creation is how we sin against each other. I hurt you. You try to hurt me again. You, and, and you hurt somebody else. That person hurts somebody else. And this, this train of destruction continues. I want power over you. You want power over me. I'm going to manipulate this. I'm going to do that. And striving for security and for advancement in life. And we rub up against each other. And so when we sin against each other, that is the thing that destroys creation. So sanctifying Shabbat becomes, the Shabbat becomes the center of our life. It becomes the rhythm of our lives. But it doesn't happen mentally. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I don't want you to embarrass yourself. But as we're on different kind of timelines of learning about the commandments and doing different things, I want you to think, how many times do you get to Friday, and let's say sundown is at 7.30. How many times, how many weeks do you get to, to Friday at 5.30 and go, oh man, it's almost Shabbat. How many times do you get to 9 o'clock and go, oh wait, I missed lighting candles or I missed I missed welcoming in Shabbat how many times do you get to Friday at noon and go oh my gosh Shabbat is, starts tonight I didn't even plan anything for you understand what I'm saying we just we we're in a learning process I don't want to heap any kind of you know guilt on anybody but to to understand that when we we need to practice this and this remembering and sanctifying becomes, in my mind, the first priority that leads to a better Shabbat observance is starting off right and understanding some things that need to be understood about how we start Shabbat. That was almost a Kamala Harris type statement. Sorry. So we're going to look at, we're going to look at, sorry, uh, the commandment to sanctify or remember Shabbat. And again, this is going to take a couple of weeks uh, to get through. And, so, and next week, I have a sp special thing for you guys. So um, make sure to be here and tune in for next week. But this is uh, a positive commandment to sanctify or remember Shabbat. And in that it is that he commanded us to sanctify the Shabbat. And to say things at its beginning and at its culmination. In them, we mention the exodus from Egypt, the holiness of the day, and its elevation and distinction from other days that precede it and follow it. And that is his, may, uh, may he be blessed, saying in Exodus 20, verse 8, remember the Shabbat day to sanctify it. Meaning to say, mention it and sanctify it with a blessing and an explanation it says in Pesachim 106a uh, which is in the Babylonian Talmud mention it over wine at its beginning and its culmination we're going to read that a little bit more later meaning Kiddush in the beginning and Havdalah in the end which is also a part of mentioning the Shabbat and the arrangement of its commandments and the regulations of the commandments have been explained 
at the end of Pesachim and other places. So the, the quick and, and dirty explanation of sanctifying remembering is when, when it says in Exodus and in Deuteronomy that we are to remember, that we are to observe the Shabbat, what that means in the Jewish mind, in the, the mind of the sages, is that we are to say something at the beginning and end of Shabbat to set it apart, to sanctify it. When we say remember, we tend to think mental, remember it, bring it to mind, right? But that word that is in, Deut in Exodus chapter 20, as a matter of fact, we can turn there if you want. We've read it several times. It's one of the kind of the key passages for, uh, for the Shabbat. This is in the first giving of the Ten Commandments or the, the Ten Words. And it says, remember Yom Shabbat, the day of Shabbat, to keep it holy, that's an interesting phrase. Interesting. I'm not sure how other, your other translations say it, but this one says, remember Yom Shabbat to keep it holy. So if remembering means only bringing it to your mind, how is that keeping it holy? That's elevating it maybe in your thoughts, which is cool. That's a part of it. But the idea of remember has more context to it. And he goes on to say, six days you work and do all your work, but the seventh is a Shabbat to Adonai your God. In it you shall not do any work, not you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the cattle, the outsider within your gates. For in six days Adonai made the heaven and earth and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed the Yom Shabbat and made it holy or sanctified it. So the commandment is to remember or sanctify Shabbat. Now that word, to remember. We've talked about this word before, uh, but I love this word, so we're going to talk about it again, is zachor. Zachor, to remember. Now, this word is an, a beautiful word and we're told to Zachar through not only Shabbat but the other festivals it comes up a lot and I want to tie this to something in the Gospels when we, when we conclude talking about this to remember has the, the best definition I've ever heard of this word someone that used to attend OAM years and years ago they said to remember to Zachar means to speak and act on behalf of to speak and act on behalf of. So I love that definition because it's more than just mental, I remember. It's, not, it's more than just bringing it back to mind, but there's an action involved with remembering. You think about a lost one, a, a loved one that you've lost. They come to mind from time to time, but how do you really, the best ways that you remember them? is usually telling stories, right, about them, talking about them, visiting and reminding family when you're together with family or when you see an old friend in town and you remember someone that was special to you that you lost. It's about speech. It's about saying something to remember, to speak on behalf of someone else. That's how you keep a memory alive is that you talk about it. You talk about the person and your interaction and your experiences with them. And that's how you keep them alive. But there's a second part to that. Whenever I do a funeral, I always talk about the, the fact that a person lives on through their children. Because not only will their children speak about mom and dad or grandma and grandpa when they're gone, but inevitably, maybe sometimes much to your chagrin, you are going to act like your parents. And generally, the older you get, I don't mean old, I mean older, 35, 45, 55, 65, it happens more and more, right? Some of you, I'm, I'm, in my, I'm 44, am I 44 or 45? 44, 44. 44, <laughs> it's not about age, it's the amount of stuff on the brain. Um, 44, and I, I could tell when it started happening. But then, right, Miss Denise said, just wait, right, but those of you that are 10 years further along than I am or 20 years or 30 years further along than I am it happens more right it happens more and it happens for 40 years <laughs> further along it happens more and you realize you have become 
that person that maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago, you almost wanted to cuss because you, didn't, because you, you just couldn't stand who they were, right? And all of, a, all of a sudden, now you are them. And yes, you speak about them fondly and you remember them in speech, but how do you really, really keep them alive? You live, you do, you act in the ways they would act. You speak in the ways that you would speak. I still remember clear as day. I was about 32, 33, and I said something, and it was my father's voice that came out of my mouth. And I remember it because it shocked me. And I thought, where is he? What is going on? It was me. And so it, you the way you remember your, the, and, and carry on the legacy of the people in your past is that you, you become like them. So you can see that remembering, even in our own understanding, when we say remember, our own vernacular says bring to mind, but in reality, we know that remembering is much more than that. The way we live out a remembrance is more than just bringing to mind. It's about speaking and acting on behalf of that person place thing time that we are remembering so it would make sense that when the father says to remember yom shabbat that our natural way of doing that would be to speak things and then would be to act on its behalf well how do we what do we say what do we speak well this is a the beautiful thing and this is how the rambam uh, talks about this that he commanded us to sanctify Shabbat and to say things at its beginning and at its culmination. In those things that we say, we mention the exodus from Egypt, the holiness of, its, of the day of Shabbat and its elevation and distinction from other days that precede it and follow it. What are we doing when we say these things? We are making a separation we're making a separation that is part of what the definition of holiness is right what do we call this thing that we say at the beginning of or that we should say at the beginning of shabbat in order to remember the shabbat what is it called it starts with a k kiddush kiddush which comes from the word kadosh holy to make holy and what did we say our definition of holiness is here at oam we have our own definition it is to be separated to god by legal restrictions and limitations because our traditional definition of holiness separated to god does not go far enough separated to god or separated to the service to god by legal restrictions and limitations and so when we say kiddush we are sanctifying which is what god did in the beginning and we are actually acting like hashem we are becoming a partner with hashem every friday evening when we say kiddush because we're doing a couple things number one we are by word we are separating the time of Shabbat, Yom Shabbat, from the other days before it and after it. In that, we are being a creator. Remember, I tell you all the time, we talked to this in our Genesis series. I plug it every chance I get because it's one of the, the proudest things I've ever taught. I'm proud of it most of all. When we think about God creating in the first week, Many times, because of what we're taught, he created ex nihilo, right? Out of nothing. And we go, man, only God could create out of nothing. And while that is true, the word to create in Genesis, bara, doesn't necessarily mean to create out of nothing. Well, what are you trying to say? I'm not trying to take anything away from you. What I want you to understand, there's a broader meaning to the idea of creation than just to create out of nothing. Because if you just think, well, I can't create like God. God created out of nothing. How can I do that? How can I partner with God? How can I be like God to be a, a, an active participant in creation? I can't do what God can do. But if we look at the work that God did during creation, he named things. He separated things. 
And a part of creation is separating, categorizing, organizing. And one of the beautiful things about Shabbat is when we make Kiddush and when we, when we make this pronouncement and we say these words is that we are organizing time. But more importantly, we are organizing our lives around time. We are making a statement that this day, this time, this 25 hours, because you start a little bit before and you go a little bit after, this 25 hours is different. I am going to be different. I am going to think differently. I am going to act differently. I am going to do life differently in this 25 hours than I do the rest of the time. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be lawless and a a wretched sinner six days and then seventh day I'm going to clean myself up. No, it means that there are restrictions that the Father has put on this time that I have to obey and that I have to do. I'm going to be be my good self, God-fearing self all during the week, but this day is still different. Yeshua himself acted one way six days and different way the seventh day. Does that mean Yeshua was a hypocrite? No, it means that he understood that there were different laws for Shabbat than there were the rest of the week. That's just the nature of holiness. It's the nature of Kedusha, which we've talked about before, right? And so we say this thing. We say Kedush. What does Kedush include? Well, we say it whenever we do uh, Kedush here. Or when you say it on, uh, on Friday evening, it's very, it's very simple that you talk about the exodus you just mention it in a paragraph that you mention exodus chapter 20 verse 8 maybe you read the commandment right there's a, a formula for that that kiddush and so in um in uh, sefer mitzvot here it has some really cool stuff about sanctifying and remember i just want to read you a, a couple of things with my eyes over here He says, we are commanded to make verbal recitations on the Shabbat day as it enters and likewise as it departs that contain a mention of the day's grandeur and exalted status and its favorable distinction from other days that precede and follow it. So there's things that we just just talked about, we just read. Our sages have told us clearly in Pesachim 106 that we are commanded to make these recitations over wine. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But the, the, uh, the... the kiddush that we have is very simple and so if you are struggling with how to begin shabbat maybe you're out there you go well like i don't believe in lighting candles that's a jewish tradition okay then do something that's not a jewish tradition or in your mind not a jewish tradition this is from the torah to sanctify it and do it so if you feel uncomfortable lighting candles because it's too jewish the jews made it up or whatever which they didn't but if if that's the way you feel that's fine then do what the torah says and mention the exodus and say it and do it there's many many times listen be completely transparent with you we have a busy life we have a very busy life and there's many times where we hit friday at sunset we hadn't prepared we haven't set a table we we barely know what we're eating or sometimes we just order out and go go get it before sundown it sometimes we hit shabbat at a hundred miles an hour and the dust doesn't settle until about two hours after kiddush and it's not for us to get on ourselves and oh get down and guilty and well i can't do it right so i'm not going to do it it's not about that it's about sometimes we pour six seven glasses of grape juice or wine and Heather and the girls light candles and we say Kiddush and that's it we don't sing songs we don't do blessing we, we do Kiddush and we all sit down and we take a breather and we eat together and we go Phew. we made it we made it by the skin of our teeth but we made it now some nights more rare we have a special meal plan we pull out a table and we dress the table and we sing and we share about our week and there are some nights like that and i wish that all of them would be like that but the bottom line is we're doing the best we can do and we want to do better the reason why i want to focus on kiddush is because it literally is the first commandment concerning shabbat and how to do it and so 
you'll hear we do Kiddush, uh, Kiddush at, at, at Oneg, um, but it's very, very simple, and we recite it. And then we do a blessing over wine. Now, here's what's really cool. There's a lot to this, and so I challenge you to go and search it out if you'd like to find out the origins of, of the wine and the bread. The, the way the wine and the bread come, to, come into tradition, you don't have to do wine and bread. That's not technically a part of Kiddush. Now, according to the sages, you make the blessing over wine. Why? Because Kiddush precedes a very, very, very important part of Shabbat on the night before, our Erev Shabbat. And that's the meal. It's very important on Shabbat to eat at least three good meals that bring you joy. Because Shabbat is all about joy. This is why in, uh, in, in, the, in Jewish homes, some traditional Jewish homes, uh, especially in America, but also in Israel, I believe there's a, 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 a dish called cholent. And cholent's like a beef, beef soup, kind of. Like what we would think of beef soup. And they put it going Friday, and it slow cooks all through the night, all the next day, so that when you come home from synagogue... On, sun, on Saturday morning, on Shabbat morning, you have this big, beautiful lunch meal that you, can, that, you, that you have. And so it's really important in the traditional Jewish home to have at least three good meals, four considering the one after Shabbat, after Havdalah. But in ancient times, part of that meal was bread because bread was precious and bread was filling and bread was a treat. And part of that was wine. Now, back in the day, wine was much stronger in a lot of ways, so wine was cut with water. One part wine to three parts water is the, the halakha on it. And I'm going to give you all the facts and figures, but the, the idea is that, see, some of these things that we do today or that is done in a Jewish home develop out of culture and just living life, right? And it's so important. We talk about this all the time. Is it commanded in the Torah to drink wine for Shabbat? No. Is it commanded in the Torah to eat bread for Shabbat? No. Where do these things come from? The Jews made them up. Stop. Stop. The, the keeping of Shabbat should intersect with your life, with real life. And so how do you beautify the Shabbat? How do you elevate the Shabbat? And, and after just saying words... Part of the definition for remember is to speak and act. So what do you do to beautify and elevate Shabbat? And we're going to talk about this more next week. But this idea of over wine. Well, wine comes before you eat bread or with bread. Bread becomes the part of the meal. The meal is the end goal. But in Judaism, you have to remember, you have to back up because there's a blessing for everything. Literally. Right? The challenge from the sages is that you bless Hashem a hundred times a day. And so you say a blessing, you, you make kiddush, you make the statement, and then before the meal, you make the blessing over wine, right? And, and why do you make a blessing over wine? Because you make a blessing over everything that goes into your body. And so we say, Baruch atah Adonai, Melekeinu, Alam, excuse me, I can't say it without singing it. Yeah, we say Bere Pri Hagafen. We say Bere Pri Hagafen, and that's the wine. And then we say Hamotzi, and we have the bread. That precedes the meal. And so it became, as a tradition, a natural, just a natural progression. Because you're going to sanctify the day, and you know that the first thing about enjoying Shabbat is going to be a big fat meal on Friday evening and so that's a, just a cliff notes version of how the, 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 the wine and the bread came to be next week we're going to talk a little bit more about that in detail about how we do it and why we do it and all these kinds of things but for this week I wanted to encourage you that the speaking as we as we Attempt and strive to become more like Messiah and as we attempt to grow in Messiah there have to be things that we do 
And if we're talking about increasing our observance, it is time, I'm gonna challenge you and push you hard, it is time to, to stop letting Shabbat just go by and just remembering it mentally. It's time to move on from that. That was elementary. Most of us have finally gotten to where we, we're not centered around sa- Sunday. We're centered around Saturday. We're mostly mentally there. But being mentally there is not enough. It is time to move past just remembering, oh, it's Friday, it means it's Shabbat. So what? So what? In your mental remembering, it's time now to start declaring and saying. And you can pull up the Kiddush. I'll have some for you next week uh, to give you something you can stick in your Bible. Or if you have a Siddur, it's in your, it's in your, uh, your Siddur. You need to start using it more anyway. Shabbat, Erev Shabbat is a great reason to use your Siddur. And as a matter of fact, um, give me a second. I'll do this on the fly. But in your Siddur, if you go to the... Uh, table of contents you probably don't have it with you David that's okay just write this down in your notes um, it will say uh, let's see page 373 in the Koran uh, uh, Sidur 373 is Kiddush and Zimarot for Shabbat evening right Kiddush and Zimarot which are songs uh, for Shabbat evening and so it's very simple you turn to page 373 and it begins with a blessing of the children okay now again that's not if you're if you're in a in a hurry you don't have your children um, at home i would still say this because it's beautiful uh, and then there is a song called shalom aleichem uh, welcome ministering angels and uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful song we'll talk about it next week as well uh, and then there's eshet chayil eshet chayil is the virtuous woman where a husband reads psalm 31 uh, over his wife and blesses his wife and then on page 382 you have kiddush for shabbat evening super simple and it begins with thus the heavens and earth were completed in all their array it quotes genesis 2 okay so you're speaking about the holiness of the day and then uh talks about later how we were uh rescued from egypt and we'll hear that again today as we say it every week and so my challenge to you is to move past just remembering it Shabbat mentally and start with Kiddush. Say it. You and your wife, if it's just you in the house, if it's just you by yourself, get alone before dark, sit down, stand up, whatever is most comfortable for you, kneel, whatever, get, I don't know, lay in the bed, I don't, it doesn't matter. Get in a place where you can focus and concentrate and you declare this day because see there's one thing about us saying oh it everybody should worship shabbat i wish all these christians would understand that shabbat is the holy day well what are you doing about it what are you doing about it you want to use shabbat as a big stick to beat christians up with are you even doing anything with it or is just that you know it's the seventh day that you use as ammunition is Shabbat a big billy club that you want to use to bash other people with? Or is it something that you're doing and something that your life is really centered around? Is it the hub and the, and the, and the, 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 the thing that you focus your whole life around? Or is it just something you know that you want to lambast other people with? So this is where we are in our, in our, in our growth. I told my, I teach Taekwondo a couple times a week. And this last week, I ran the kids into the ground. They were exhausted and hurting I said I'm going to make you exercise until I'm tired and afterwards we had a little thing we do called mat chat where everybody just kind of hangs out and we talk and I'm trying to get them to understand what a lot of us adults don't understand when you make yourself do something that's hard when you make yourself do something that you don't want to do do you know it physically changes your brain there's a part in the middle of your brain and it's got a scientific name about this long so i don't remember what it's called forgive me well synaptic pathways yeah it when you force yourself to do something you don't want to do because it's hard there's a part of your brain that actually grows physically bigger it actually makes it larger physically. And while we can do that in exercise and diet and all this other different kind of stuff, we can use that same understanding in our spiritual life. 
And when we do things that are hard and we do them anyway, even if we don't do them the best or we're not really happy with how we did them, the fact that we strengthen ourselves, we gird ourselves and we push forward and we do them, sometimes even if our heart's not in it, actually changes us physically. It's an incredible thing. It's almost like there's a master creator that gave us tools and, and, and ways of being that would help us to become better and to change and to evolve into better people. It's a wonderful thing. And so I wanna challenge you guys, those of you that don't, I know many of you do, but those of you that don't, make Kiddush the aim of your week. Make it the goal all week. I want you to think about Kiddush before sunset on Friday evening. Make that the thing that you think about. Put it on your calendar, right on your refrigerator, put it in your Bible, whatever. Put it on your rear view mirror in your vehicle, your bathroom mirror, whatever it is. Kiddush Friday evening. Uh, Kiddush, uh, let's see, sunset or, or uh, uh, Shabbat time for this next Friday night is 7, 702. So Shabbat, uh, Friday evening, the 13th, Shabbat begins at 7.02. So 7 o'clock, you should be saying Kiddush and lighting candles if you, if you do that. And that begins Shabbat. That's the legal beginning of your Shabbat. And so that's my, my challenge for you. Again, next week, I have a special presentation for you guys that's going to show you a little bit more of what's possible on Shabbat. And I'm really excited about that. And we'll talk through some more of these things. Amen? Amen. Thank you guys for being with us.